Um, so just a quick introduction. I'm a Canadian from Ottawa, which you can see on the top right. Uh, we have some good skating, if you're ever there. Uh, I did my PhD in Japan, and I'm working since 2014 in Homsta. Uh, so I'm working on uh, social robots intended to support well-being, uh, so in recognizing what people do and generating behavior for the robot to lead to good interactions. And I'm also uh, working with applications involved with entertainment and art. Um, so what is the common link between entertainment and art? Well, I think there's many different factors, but uh, two of them maybe are enjoyment and creativity. Uh, so art is creative typically, it can also be enjoyable, entertainment is typically enjoyable, it can also be creative. How do I define enjoyment? Well, I, I call it a pleasant experiential state at the heart of entertainment uh, and an important optimization criterion related to satisfaction and usability. For creativity, different people have different definitions, but I, I think this is kind of fun, so I'll go through some of this stuff. Uh, Cope defined it as the ability to associate things which are not typically associated. Col for Colton, this is more than just imagination. It's also the skill to be able to create and the ability to look at what has been created and assess it. Uh, a common thing that I hear is this view that maybe computers can never truly be creative. They just recycle data from people. So they take input uh, from stuff that people have already made. Uh, so my feeling is that people also take input. We don't start painting when we're babies. Um, so uh, a different way of looking at things is not that creativity is something that you have or don't have. Uh, so Winnegar has said that it's a way of doing things. And when we define it that way, we can start to work with computers and robots. We can actually get them to follow a process. Um, so a little bit of creativity in entertainment and art uh, Hutchison defined one of the strong uh, theories of humor, uh, which is about incongruity, which relates very much, I think, to creativity. And this is uh, an example of this is if I'm eating a sandwich, it's maybe very normal, but if the sandwich is very tiny or very gigantic, it can be humorous. Uh, so this is one of the ways creativity can tie in with entertainment. Uh, in art, uh, the ancient Greeks apparently did not consider uh, painting and drawing to be creative. Um, so they thought that poetry was the ultimate act of creation. But in the Roman times, Horace came along and he said, quod libet audendi, the, the, the painters as well can, uh, are free to uh, do as much as they dare. So it's not just mimicking sunsets or drawing what you see of a person, but it's also more than that. Uh, so some previous work um, for, there's really good examples of computers and robots in entertainment, especially computer games. Uh, it's a massive industry, uh, great success. Uh, for robots, we have some cool robots that can play tag with you. They can actually watch what you're doing and then figure out the rules of the game and then join in. Uh, we have robots that can play specific games like table tennis, uh, paper, rock, scissors. They use high-speed cameras so they can tell before you do what you're going to do, exactly what you're going to do. And they, they're cheating, basically. But uh, So don't play against robots. That's one game to avoid. Uh, we have pet robots like Aibo and Pado. And for those of you who don't know, there's a new Aibo coming out. It's this robot dog on the right. It's the old one. Uh, but there's a new one coming out, so this is going to be really fun. Pado is this uh, baby seal-like creature on the lower left, which uh, elderly people uh, sometimes like. It's uh, like a pet, but it, uh, it won't have diseases. It uh, can be cleaned more easily. Uh, there's really fun mechatronics in theme parks and hotels now. So if you want, you can go to the Henna Hotel in Japan and actually talk uh, at the front desk to a dinosaur robot in either chi Chinese, English, or Japanese. Uh, so. Um, I'll start out with talking about uh, writing, which the ancient Greeks were uh, very impressed with. Um, so here, the bulk of the work is being done by computers, I think, generating content, but also as a medium. So um, you can see uh, some interesting examples are Wordsmith uh, and Quill, which can take some data that you give it and then write an article for you. Uh, for software, we also have games like No Man's Sky, which can uh, generate content so we can have unique aliens and unique planets. Uh, Angelina is an example of a software that writes games. Uh, 
Um, so if you're interested, you can follow that link down there. Um, I, I'm sure there'll be a video of this afterwards, and you can actually play some of these games. Um, so the, the role robots play is more of the medium. So they'll read out stuff like writing or poetry. And uh, one of the studies in the previous in the lab where I was previously um, found that by having this Android over here read out uh, poems, people were actually able to feel more immersed and uh, in some way enjoy the poem more because it didn't have all these nervous gestures that people have, uh, tapping their fingers or shifting from one side to another. Uh, here's an example of a computer-generated poem. Um, so I really like this one. Uh, you can read it. Uh, and uh, so they, they've got really uh, good success with these poems. Uh, they're, they're sort of passing the Turing test for poetry. Uh, a lot of these poems generated by computers, people think are written by people, and they really like them. Uh, so this is really cool, I think. Uh, this is another example of a poem. Uh, and the reason that this one is cool is because uh, it's not just the poem at the top, but this AI can actually describe why it wrote that poem. What was it trying to do? So this one actually read an article in a newspaper about something, and then it tried to express that. But choosing some type of um, poetical process to express that. Uh, robots have been used in theater, comedy, magic. So uh, one of the good things with robots is that they can perform the same actions each time, and they can do it at any time. So we can have three robots, one in, in Japan, in Russia, in America, doing the exact same play, uh, looking exactly the same. Uh, problems right now, uh, robots can be expensive, or the price of a car maybe. Uh, there can be delays if you don't set up your programs right. Sometimes this happens. Uh, and they can be inflexible. Real humans can adapt to uh, impromptu changes, but robots have difficulty with that so far. Um, so if you're interested, you can check out these examples, like the robot thespians in Poland uh, are robot actors, and there's uh, a Shakespeare play with flying robots, and there's this Sayonara, which uh, is from my previous lab, uh, which is, I think, uh, which was using that same robot that was reading poetry. Uh, comedy, we have the Papero robot, it was a little robot which was a sidekick to a comedian. We have the Beicho android, which is actually a copy of a living treasure in Japan. So it says exactly what he says and it uh, makes the same movements when he's telling his funny stories. Uh, so it's not the assistant, it is the, the comedian himself. Uh, for magic, you can check out Marco Tempest and Edie on the internet. Uh, it's uh, quite fun. And there's many more, so I, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of stuff. Um, music is another really cool thing. Uh, so if you go on YouTube, you can check out Sony CSL. I guess it's Computer Science Lab. And you can listen to lots of uh, artificial songs composed by AIs. Uh, you can also look at Google Magenta's project started 2015. So their performance RNN also composes songs. And synth will blend different uh, notes from different instruments. If you want to dance with robots, you can. Um, so this is pretty old, actually. This uh, one on the bottom left is from uh, sort of the north of Japan, Tohoku University. And you can dance ballroom with it. Uh, and a Canadian robot recently has also uh, been dancing ballroom. Uh, so if you like that, you, you're very welcome. Dancing and singing. Uh, so this was in a previous presentation, this robot in the middle. But uh, this robot uh, can sing and dance. It, it actually has the legs to be able to move around the stage. Uh, and of course, you can have augmented reality stuff. So like this uh, photo on the bottom right, where this guy has set up uh, Hatsune Miku, this avatar, to sing and dance while he plays the piano. Um, so, like the keynote speaker, the first keynote speaker in the morning said, uh, there's a big history also with architecture and robotics and AIs. Uh, so, if you want, uh, 3D printing is also really uh, a, an interesting technology here. So, in, there's a company in Korea where you can print your family members. You can print your children, for example, in little versions. Uh, and uh, in Japan, they take sonograms, and you can also have... Uh, a 3D printed fetus. Uh, people are doing stuff with food, uh, like chocolate, candy, and pizza. NASA has given money for this. For their, they want their astronauts, when they're going on long missions, to be able to eat something nice. 
and uh, houses. So for this structure, for example, on the bottom left, uh, this is from ETH in Switzerland, uh, where these flying robots have deposited bricks to build this structure. Um, so for visual arts uh, and drawing, uh, there's lots of cool stuff that you can play around with. So uh, maybe some of you know this Prisma app uh, for cell phones. There's also Neural Doodle, which does basically the same type of thing. You can uh, take a photo or make some type of quick sketch, and then it'll make it actually look like a real uh, nice painting. Uh, Deep Dream was uh, also really cool. So it's this thing on the bottom uh, left. Uh, so this, they've uh, trained a classifier, a neural network, to recognize animals, in this case dogs, and they've used a seed image, which is a bit of toast, and they've created dog toast. So uh, you're really free to do a lot of things if you can imagine it. You can make some really interesting art. Uh, and of course I'm skipping out on lots of stuff here. Sketch RNN is another thing that I think is ultra cool. So this is Google Magenta. If you go to the site, you can play around with it. There's a link there. And uh, it's sort of hard to tell from this horrible drawing at the top right, but uh, I actually drew just the this horrible outline of a cat's face, and then it actually filled in the, the cat's whiskers and face for me. Uh, and one that's related to it in the bottom right is called Auto Draw. So I've also, on the left, I've tried to draw a really bad cat again. Uh, this is not one of my strong fields, but it is. it can actually generate then this pretty image of a, a cat say, this is probably what you wanted to draw. Uh, another cool work that I saw recently uh, is about using these things that are called creative adversarial networks. So they have a generator, which is generating possible artwork, and a discriminator, which is an art critic, and it's saying this is good or bad. And they try to have some novelty, not too much, because then it might seem strange, uh, and then a little bit of style ambiguity. And they've had really good results. Uh, again, people are looking at some of these things and saying, this probably came from humans. And uh, in, in some of their tests, they were saying, oh, this is actually better than some of the artwork that was produced by humans. Uh, so I'll talk just a bit about this robot art competition, which is uh, a very fun event, I think. Uh, so they give 100,000 US dollars every year to robots who, uh, who paint artwork. And if you want to enter this thing, you just have to send one to six paintings uh, painted by a robot. And it's evaluated both uh, by a Facebook vote, by a popular vote, and also by five judges who are experts in different fields. So these are some examples for uh, paintings from 2016. Uh, so you can see pictures of Einstein and George Washington. And uh, these three pictures at the bottom are actually from one of my former colleagues. And it was kind of fun. He had a robot snake. And the robot snake would listen to music while it was drawing with a paintbrush in its mouth. And it's sort of wild, but I think quite uh, fun. Uh, 2017, uh, these robots are really making beautiful stuff, I think. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just to go into some of the stuff that we are doing at my university, uh, I'm working on... Uh, recognizing and behavior generation, like I mentioned. And so two of the things that I think will uh, be useful in interactions with humans are enjoyment and affection. So I focused on stuff that uh, people enjoy or uh, stuff, uh, ways, ways that machines can be liked by humans. And I've also worked with uh, doing stuff that's sort of functional, like reaching for something and inserting emotion into that and using uh, modalities that are a little bit rare, like having a robot that can grow warm to show that it likes you, or using thermal cameras. Um, so the idea, our, I had an idea, uh, which was to try to be able to convey emotions of a human using a robot's art. Uh, and the idea was to use this simple model, this dimensional model of emotion proposed by Russell, which uh, separates emotions into valence and arousal. So valence is how happy or how sad you're feeling, arousal is, are you excited, are you relaxed? And the idea was that if we can work with this type of thing, we can maybe intervene with people with autism or depression or some type of trauma and try to make them feel better. Uh, people with autism have difficulty expressing their emotions. Uh, depressed people, people with trauma may want to work through their emotions. Uh, and I don't want them to just be sort of in a room by themselves. So that was the idea with having a robot. They can maybe feel like there's somebody with them. They're not alone. Uh, challenges. Human emotions are very complex. Art 
how we perceive art is not well understood still. Uh, so the approach that we had was to try to recognize what people are feeling using uh, a brain-computer interface, like you see on the bottom left, uh, with a thermal camera, which you see bottom right, and then creating some type of model for mapping those emotions into artwork by working with some professional artists. So these are our professional artists at the top left, uh, Peter Wallbeck, if some of you who are Swedish maybe know of him, uh, and Dan Kuhn from America. We had some students working on it, and then our robot, uh, the Baxter robot from Rethink Robotics, which we called Rob Boss in honor of Bob Ross, the prolific painter. And what type of system did we use to map emotions to artwork? We used some heuristics. Um, so um, we use something called a Stolls model, for example, which maps the color wheel into Russell's emotions. And we had a list of about 10 or so features like this. Uh, these are just a few examples. So maybe something is a painting is very light. It can be a little bit positive. It's a very dark and gloomy. It can be negative. If we use lots of warm colors, uh, then we can feel that there's energy in life there. If it's cold, it might be a bit static. So here are some examples of the sketches that our artist drew to show different emotions. And based on that, uh, we then uh, created the system where we're reading his emotions through this BCI here, uh, and then we're sending it to the computer as uh, values between zero and one for valence and arousal. And then the robot is using that to create a composition with some variance and actually draw that. So here are some examples of uh, paintings that a human draw on the on, drew on the left with what our robot drew on the right to express different emotions. So they weren't trying to draw the same painting, it was just trying to express the same emotion. And so there is some similarity in the color schemes because the artists were aware of the robot, but um, they weren't trying to draw the same thing. So this is calmness, uh, a miserable feeling, and happiness. Uh, and so we had uh, actually a really good result. Uh, we got sixth place in the world, and uh, that was really awesome. So for anybody who's interested in this type of thing, I really recommend this event. It's something very interesting and fun. So thoughts about the future. Um, I think that uh, some other people have mentioned this, but we've seen uh, quite a lot of diversification of the roles that robots and computers can play, and we'll continue to see this type of thing. So right now, we often have pets and uh, little child robots which are playing with people, but I think we're going to see maybe also uh, robot guardians which can take care of children. When the children are bored or lonely, the robot can maybe paint with them, keep them uh, entertained. Robots is art and artists. Uh, so currently, we have... Uh, uh, these beautiful androids, for example, which are in some ways, uh, they, they look like art, and we have uh, also robots which paint and do stuff, but we'll also have maybe art teachers, intelligent tutoring systems, therapists, and critics. Um, so currently there's a trend in education called the robotics revolution, where people are using robots to teach courses that have nothing to do with engineering or robots. Uh, so here's a, a little example of uh, my robot in the robot who is painting uh, in my classroom. So he's actually teaching an engineering course, but um, we could teach painting or something else also with him. Um, other stuff. Uh, so I have something that I call the smartphone hypothesis, which is just that um, when robots can do lots of useful tasks like a smartphone can for you and they don't cost too much, we'll start to actually see these things in people's homes and public places like stations. So right now we have these vacuum cleaner robots in some homes, lawnmower robots. In the future, hopefully the near future, we'll see these same robots, but also maybe some robots capable of more general abilities to help out in the homes. They can maybe do your laundry, but also check your grandmother if she falls down and help her. Um, Robots will be more human-like, so right now we're still in the deep learning craze uh, where we use lots of examples and these neural networks with many layers and we get incredibly high accuracies um, for classifying some different stuff. But uh, we're also going to do uh, some simple single example learning. So humans, adult humans, can see a single example of something and imagine lots of other stuff. So we want to give that type of ability to robots as well. Uh, of course, big data, we have all this storage, we have lots of data on what people like, we can transfer knowledge between different robots, uh, analyze different groups of users, and take out those nice trends to try to 
create very effective uh, systems to help people. Uh, this is really a big one, personalization in mass production. We're going to see a lot of more personalized entertainment and artwork. Uh, so AIs and robots, we can produce stuff very easily, anytime. If you can't sleep, if you at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can still get this AI maybe to write you a story. Um, so one problem with that is art now going to be too easy, some people are saying. Um, so uh, one opinion about this is that it's maybe not so much about the tool or the medium, but the idea behind the, uh, the medium that's important. Uh, so I think there's going to be time where people have to explore the limitations of these new media and see what are they good at, what are they not good at. Uh, identities. Robots will be able to produce very beautiful, perfect photoreal artwork, but they'll also be able to mimic us and fake it and produce childlike, human-like drawings. Um, so what exactly makes us special? Uh, I think we have to think about these things. And I've put this horrible tiny little image that you can't see here. Um, this is from my wife's research, actually. Uh, when she was a master student, and she was using one of these android robots to try to break down uh, what makes us who we are as individuals. And she was using the, the robot to show uh, just the person's content of their conversation, what were the words that they used, uh, how do they say it, how do they move, uh, and how do they look, and trying to figure out which of these was the most important for friends and family to recognize uh, another person. And what they found was actually that it was an interlinking of different components. It wasn't so much just one component, but this combination that was important. Um, yeah, so, but I think this is a very interesting question for the future. Uh, so thanks very much for listening.